It's Friday, September 6th, and today I talk with Tommy Ryan about a book called Managing the Professional Service Firm by David Meister. We talk about what are our top 10, maybe plus one more, takeaways from the book. Enjoy. Hi, and welcome to the Work Together Better podcast. This is your host, Danny Ryan. This is Three Wheels' official podcast about enterprise collaboration, how people, process, and technology combine to help organizations, departments, and teams work together better. Today, I'm sitting down with Tommy Ryan. How's it going, Tommy? It's going well. Yeah? Yeah, it is. I'm looking forward to a, another Clemson football weekend. Oh, rub it in while it hurts, buddy. Rub it in. While it hurts. <laughs> so for people who are listening, Tommy, oh, yeah, we did uh, play you last week. Yeah, I know, Tom, Tommy. Tommy did. We our teams, uh, our alma maters, did play last week, and and uh, Tommy's alma mater did uh, wipe the field with uh, Georgia Tech's <laughs> uh, players, and it was it was kind of tough. But I'm glad that we were able to help you guys get off to a a good start in the season. It's, it was a wonderful scrimmage. It was, it was wonderful. <laughs> we're, here, we're just here to help, buddy. We're here to help. So today we're going to be talking about a book called Managing the Professional Services Firm. It's a book that was sitting up on my bookshelf and uh, sitting there for quite a while. And it was one of those that I always wanted to get to but never did. And I figured once I picked it up, maybe for accountability reasons, just sort of like structured it for the company to go through it and and go through it together and sort of uh, reflect on um, where Three Will is and what uh, what we can learn from the book. It's done by a professor who sort of studies different um, organizations, in, uh, in particular in the professional services industry. And so we picked it up, uh, framed it up, and every week got together for well, over the last maybe two or three months and had discussions about the content of the book. And so what I've done for this discussion is to say what my top 10 takeaways are from the book. And what will be interesting is, is we're in that time of year where we're getting ready for 2020 and doing a little bit of planning. And I think at the end of this conversation, Tommy, I'd love to just sort of talk through like, what are your, what are your takeaways? What do you think? Um, what are, what, what do you have that sort of action items from this or what, what things do we, um, should we think about considering to do for the upcoming year? Well, this talk will, will inspire me to think of those things. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> um, so the first uh, thing, uh, first takeaway that we have is uh, that there are three types of client work. And this is fairly early on in the book. And so he describes the three types of client work. There's brains, which is hire us because we're smart. There's gray hair, which is hire us because we've been through this before. And we have practice with solving this type of problem. And then there's procedure, which is hire us because we know how to do this and can deliver it uh, efficiently. So um, with the three types of work, you know, this got me thinking right away is sort of like what types of work does three will do? And I think um, we've had each one of these three. I think a lot of our work is gray hair work because a lot of um, the larger companies that we work with, uh, they are looking to hire us because of some sort of experience maybe that we've had with other uh, clients and we've solved the problem before. And they, and for a risk standpoint, they would rather hire an outside firm to come in, take care of it, make sure it gets, it, it happens and, and not have to learn the things that you learn the first time you do something. And so they, a lot of our work is gray hair. There are some, some parts of our work, which is brains where it's, you know, it's nobody's done it before and they hire us because they know we're smart. They know uh, how we work as an organization and, it, they can't find somebody who's done it before. And so having somebody like Three Will that they trust is someone they could bring in to help out. And then some of the projects that we've been doing for many years end up converting over from a gray hair over towards more of a procedure one, which is one where we've done it so many times that we can do, really do, do it efficiently. So uh, thoughts, Tommy, about the three types of client work? Well, I, I do think we do all three. And one of the things that I was grappling with as we're going through the book is now, do we need to make sure we're doing one of those and stay focused in that lane so we can maximize organizationally how do we deliver 
And I think a lot of what I heard from the book is trying to push things down the chain into more procedural because that's where it becomes more efficient for your organization, more profitable for your organization. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have so many experienced people. The makeup of the team, I think, pushes us up more in the gray hair and, and, and brains activities. Um, and, it, and it works well for us, but I think as a challenge to our organization is finding ways to have more procedural type engagements and in your top 10 giveaways or takeaways, um, you know, no free prizes here, but <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> you get into things like under delegation and those types of topics. And I think those are some areas that we can learn and, and kind of grow and, and move in that direction of having more procedural type work. Awesome. Number two is the importance of leverage, which I think we're getting into right now, which is, he says, the successful leveraging of top professionals is at the heart of success of any of a professional firm. So leverage is like um, when you have, um, it's getting the, really getting the most out of the, the, the high-end professionals that you have. And, um, and really trying to focus in on, you know, how do you build out an organization where everybody, you know, you don't have all top um, high level, uh, you know, ex highly experienced types of folks, but how do you grow people under it? And the, the leveraging is, is taking somebody who's very experienced and having people uh, leveraging their experience so that you're able to build out an organization to grow an organization. And he says that some of the key roles of leveraging leverage uh, of leverage is uh, when you consider new projects to take, it's usually more profitable for the firm to engage in one similar to a recently performed uh, for a previous client. So you've something you've done before. While it's the best interest of the firm uh, to do repeat uh, repetitive engagements, it's not often in accord with the desires of individuals involved. So. Just like you know, that we a lot of people like to take on new types of projects and really like more of the brains types of projects. Um, and he's pointing right. out here that the, the, the solution is to convert these past experience and expertise of the individual into expertise of the firm by uh, accepting a similar project, but utilizing a greater proportion of junior folks, so, so people who are not as senior on the second or third time projects. And so he's saying like, okay, you go deliver this killer project for X organization. He's like, I know you want to go do the next killer project for Y organization, but can you do a similar type of project for Y organization than what you did for X? And in that next time that you go do it, you're going to be able to utilize more junior people to go make it happen. And he's just pointing out that that's where you get efficiencies out of the professional services firm. That's where you're able to get, you know, to really to be able to have people grow, to put lower cost resources onto projects and get higher margins. Those types of things he's really saying are, are important things as a professional services organization. One more thing, and I'll let you comment on this, Tom. Okay. It, it says, he says it should be immediately stressed that uh, that high leverage is not always good. As we've already observed, having high leverage is completely inappropriate if the firm has a high level of brains work. So if you're doing brains work and that's all you're doing, he's saying like you can't – you. You can't do this. You've, it's more of like you're moving from gray haired over to, towards more procedural type of work. So thoughts on leverage, Tom? Yeah, I think we're, we're challenged with this. This is definitely um, a tough nut to crack for us. Um, a lot of the work that we do, we're usually taking on agile custom work. I mean, a lot of the things that we seek are in that area. And that tends to lend itself to more brains and less procedural operational work. The work that we do with migrations, um, we've also found that there's always new challenges in, quote, a repetitive project. So the way we're trying to address how can you take some of that and make it procedural is to have a shared service that is the underpinnings of the repetitive parts of what you do in these types of projects. And that way we can have some agility to what's different in the project and covered by more of the gray hair brains. And then some of the procedural things that are repetitive to the migration activities have that in a shared service that services the project teams that are 
interfacing with the clients. So, you know, that's something that's fairly new for us. Um, we look at it as a way to, you know, be more efficient and effective. And, and that's good for our customers when we can find ways of doing that. Great. The third takeaway is the under delegation prob- problem, which we were getting into. It's like what percentage of your professional time, and this is sort of the key question, what percentage of your p- professional work time is spent doing things that a more junior person could do? if we got organized and trained the junior person to handle it with quality. And the reason why this is a problem is because it impacts profitability, it impacts skill building, it impacts morale, and it under-invests under invests in the future. And um, so there, we know that, that, that this is like, the, this is a, a, a that every, it's something that everybody fights against. So this is something where, you know, it's a, he, he said it's, it's very prevalent inside of professional services engagements. So while there's clearly a variety of uh, personal factors at work, which is like, I prefer to do it myself, or I have confidence that it'll be done correctly if I do it. Um, I have lear- I've learned that the bigger explanation is provided by the measurement and reward systems of most firms. You know, we have uh, what's being, um, you know, as with most professional services firms, we're, we're monitoring things like, uh, you know, utilization and these other things, which might be counter to like, am I going to be spending my time, you know, getting somebody up to speed on something versus t- the time that I'm spending on building a project or uh, learning a new technology or these different types of things. And he's just pointing out, like, typically it's a it's a, sy- a systemic problem that yes. is the reason why we under uh, under delegate. And unless you either met, and this gets into sort of like the follow ups from the book, he's like, unless you measure something that says skills, you know, that has something about skills transfer, he's like, this you'll always have this problem. This is just going to be a prevalent problem because your systems, what you're uh, what you're monitoring, do not you know, align with uh, delegating. They don't align with doing, taking the time to go do this. Thoughts? Oh, a lot of thoughts on this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think definitely you, your behaviors come out of what you measure. Um, there, there are kind of base values and, and kind of core raw material of good people that you bring into an organization, but at the end of the day, a lot of your behavior is based on what, what is measured. And so if you do measure something, um, you have to have, I think, some counterbalances to keep things in check that you're doing the right thing overall. And, and if you measure one thing, typically that one thing can't always be the perfect measure, that there has to be other measures that keep you balanced um, and, and working on the things that are going to um, create the right health within the organization. And what I think it can be a challenge is, you know, sometimes you say, well, at the end of the day, it's um, as a business, it's the, it's the net profit of the organization. So, but you want to have people connected to that. You know, what, what part do I play in being able to drive a healthy financial an kind of economic engine for a company. And we picked utilization because it was a very closely correlated. I know if I put in my the hours that I'm scheduled for the project, I'm helping the team. Um, what I think we're, we're missing, and this is kind of one of the things emerging for me out of the book, is, is there a way to show financial health and have that, you know, calibrate itself um, with the utilization and and how do you do that in a way that does promote um, a learning organization that pushes knowledge down to the the newer people in the organization and and creates an environment that you can bring on newer people i think we've been challenged that we tend to hire the gray hairs and we have a hard time hiring those junior people that have i think a wealth of opportunity to work at three will it's just finding out how do you support and create a systematic way to bring those people in and and have them be successful yep yeah tough problem to solve it is yeah it is it absolutely is um and and it's it's part of it's kind of good to hear that a lot of people have the same problem it's sort of one of those outstanding problems for any professional services organization number four is 
about how clients choose. Uh, and he points out that the, the single most important talent in selling professional services is the ability to understand the purchasing process, not the sales process, from the client's perspective. Professionals traditionally view their practice development task as divided into two stages, marketing, which is generating the lead, and selling, which is converting a lead into a sale. From a buyer's perspective, these two stages are experienced as qualification and selection. Can you do it changes to, do I want to work with you? And I think this was a really good, important one for us to point out, which is understand, try to understand, I think in, 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 in sales, try to understand what that purchasing process is. And thinking through the eyes of the other person, is re, this, is, this is what comes through very crystal clear with this. And also just realizing like from a buyer's standpoint is doing a little bit of when's the last time that we as individuals have hired someone for professional services and, and what was our initial question? Yeah, can you do it? Is, is this someone who's competent uh, and has the experience to be able to do this? And then before we, you know, we might find a couple of people who are able to do it. And then the question converts to, do I want to work with you? Is this the right. type of person that I want to work with? Are they going to see it through to the end? Are they the type of person who, as soon as I change my mind, they're going to make me pay for it? Or all these sorts of things, you know, you really try to think of things through the, through the other person's viewpoint. Yeah. I, what I liked about this is that, do I want to work with you um, question. The can you do it? I think we put so much energy around engineering the way we can estimate things, um, making sure that we're technically correct in what we're doing, uh, you know, making sure we're kind of covering all the angles from the block and tackle of delivering it. Um, what I find um, is an area of growth for us is how do we create the the activities and interactions that make them feel like we're taking care of them beyond that, that, that we have some of the soft, softer skills of, you know, empathic listening, um, trying to role play, you know, what is it going to look like when you engage with us by bringing in some of the disciplines that we see in, in a delivery project into the sales process. And, you know, I've heard you say this is, uh, we we want to try to have them experience what our delivery will be in the sales process. We're not just trying to you know, sell them this, but actually show them how we can do this. And that um, goes a long way where we you know, make and keep commitments, try to uh, break down um, risks and impediments and show some constructive moving the ball forward in things like action plans with our customers. So that I think falls in that area of, you know, do I want to work with you? You know, do, do, do I feel like there's discipline there to take care of me? And not only can you do the technical things is do I enjoy working with you? And you've got another takeaway later on in the deck that I think speaks to that is, you know, what's, what's that quality of service? And that's, mm -hmm. that's probably the thing that I feel that I, I like for us to hone in on is, you know, how do we yep. raise up that quality of service? Um, that, that's something where I think we've got great potential because we've got great people and it's just not, there's not as much focus on are we doing, you know, the quality of service. We, 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 we have great quality of service, but I think there's opportunity of improvement if we think of it from, not just the delivery work, the quality of work, but how do we, you know, give them a better experience? And that, that will speak to this, you know, do I want to work with you? Yep. Yep. Um, we were actually, that's number six. Let's hit number five. And then I, I do want to jump into that one, which is a great one. And the number five is about practice development, which is sort of a pseudonym for him for sales and marketing. Um, and, he points out like a, a per, it sort of starts off of this chapter with talking about like what's mar what does marketing mean to mo uh, to most folks and sort of and he ends up um, talking about five main categories of activity with regards to practice development. He calls it broadcasting, 
courting, super pleasing, nurturing, and listening. And within these, his, he says, my, my observation of professional firms, uh, professional firms in general, that they tend to overinvest in non-billable practice development times in categories mentioned first on my list, which was like broadcasting and courting. And as a rule, underinvest in those activities lower on my list, ones like super pleasing, nurturing, and listening. In large part, I've learned this is because firms tend to assume that the last three categories all occur naturally during the conduct of matters, i.e. on billable time, and hence do not warrant any extra investment of non-billable time. This, in my experience, is an incorrect assumption. So he's pointing out things like, like I like this idea of like super pleasing. He's what he's oh, saying yeah. here is, is like, you have a client, like, like we're wrapping up a project with one of our clients, and he would say, go back in and like, like do stuff to, that would just knock their socks off. And so this whole idea of super pleasing would be like, oh man, they they I, they did things I I. I no expectation of them right. doing and like imagine spending that time and, and then and then like that would lead towards more project work or that would lead towards well why don't you guys go look at this maybe you guys you m- might not have experience with this but i'd like for you guys to go look at this and so i think it was really interesting i think for for us where it's always sort of like okay wrap up the project and all of a sudden we're broadcasting the world about, about what we can do and trying to find that next client or or quartering somebody, or, and it just really, I, th- I think it was good, sort of pointed out um, some some of the activities that we make the assumption we're doing on projects, and so we don't have to worry about them outside of projects. Yeah, and I think, you know, we um, we do a decent job in some of this, uh, in terms of super pleasing, where uh, we, we try not to put the client in a situation where we're going back and Technically, we could get a change order. We we end up let, let's find a way to get it get it done within the constraints and um, and and I think I I've seen examples where um, like Bo on a recent project you know went and put in a, a whole bunch of non billable time in between a project where he knew a technology was coming into play and and showed you know. A, a lot of progress that quote wasn't billed to the client, but got them ahead of the game. And, um, you know, people love that, you know, just think about the experiences you have with people that come quote, serve you as a customer and, in, in your general house projects, you know, a plumber comes over and, you know, while he's there, you know, he fix, fixes a flapper on the side, doesn't charge you. And it took, took him five minutes but, you know, he could have technically charged you for that activity. But, you know, he's looking at ways of how can I exceed expectations and, um, you know, make them want to call me next time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I like this idea of super pleasing. It yeah. seems like it's a, especially when you, because what he's talking about is really like there was one part of the book where he was saying like, if you, what are the things that you would do? Like if you had an app, you know, uh, either like an hour of work or a thousand dollars, like where would you spend the money to find that next thing? And it's like some of these things, it's like with that, you know, and, and we're, I don't think this comes out sort of in the, in the top 10, but really the importance of repeat work with existing clients is a very prevalent message within this book. He goes through all the reasons why, but it just tells me like, it, you know, like continuing to, develop these relationships and looking for things as opposed to just sort of like moving on to the next client and just sort of calling it a day. Right. Yeah. Um, the uh, next one that we have, and you ready for this one? Quality work doesn't mean quality service. I think this was one that, um, man, it seems like this is a, if you're snoozing through this right now, pay attention. (laughs) You know, this is the important one. This is a really important one. Whether logical or illogical, sensible or not, even the most sophisticated client will come to focus more heavily on the quality of service than on the quality of work. Okay. So what they look at, what this means is, is like, you know, when you, um, When uh, you're looking at whether who to choose, like who do you want to work with, you end up saying like this group of people (laughs) probably can solve my problem. So what ends up really becoming 
important to you is like, how are they like, what's the quality of experience, the quality of service that I'm going to get um, when, when I'm working with this person. And, and as much as like, if you've ever worked with somebody who's like, they're the best in town or they're the best in the world at doing something. I mean, you might put up with it, but you also, you would, you know, you come to like with a lot of different types of project work, even though we think everything is like only we can do it in the world. The fact is, is there's a lot of other organizations who probably can do it, but what puts you over the top is going to be the quality of service. Uh, yeah. What's, uh, th this what really opened my eyes a bit because um, I think we definitely care a lot about the quality of work. I think a lot of what's ingrained into the team is, you know, high integrity, high responsibility, and really just, you know, making sure that we don't leave behind something we wouldn't be proud of. Um, that, I, I don't think you want to um, sacrifice, let's say, your quality of work. I think, but um, it's, you know, that sense of, you know, don't gold plate the, that work and, and be consultative around where you take shortcuts, where you, you know, decide that this is good enough. And then putting the energy in the areas of um, let me think a couple steps ahead for the client, kind of put myself in their shoes and kind of break down, you know, some of the, the upcoming impediments, you know, you know, just thinking of ways that you feel like they're not just doing what I tell them yeah. to yeah. do. They're actually understanding my problem, empathizing with that and, you know, taking this on as it were their own problem. And, and we like to say that, and, you know, our commitment, you know, in the three C's, we truly try to install that, you know, instill that into people's hearts of, you know, let's really care about, um, are we showing that we're thinking of this um, in, in ways that makes their life easier? And I think quality of service is all speaking to that. And, um, I, you know, I do think we have um, room for growth. I think there's some consultative skills yeah. that um, maybe have waned a bit um, since the, the beginning of the company and finding ways to re-energize that um, to, you know, be sure we're coming in as consultants, not developers. Um, and at the end of the day, people want a consultant, not a developer. He, he pointed out a, a, a part of um, like a, an archetypal, uh, archetypal situation where, um, he would go around and you know be at different companies, and he would said that he would always be concerned at the companies where he heard these phrases, and he heard it quite a lot, which was, "We could do great work." He says, "I have heard frequently if the client did not keep getting in the way." <laughs> that's someone. That's someone who's. That's someone who's saying like, "We, you know, it's all about the work that we do," and the client just is like they're getting in the way. So that's someone who's really highly focused on the quality of work and the quality of service. Like, you, you know, but it, it, I think what, where this ends up playing out is we had a good discussion around this, around like where you bring your automobile to get fixed. And I know you have a Tesla, so this never happens to you anymore. <laughs> but for the rest of us who do have a mechanical car, um, you know, when you think about bringing it in to get service, like I bring it into uh, Corey's and the reason why I'm sure like there's a lot of different places you can bring it to. And in my mind, there will be places that will be better than others. And I want to check the ratings and all that sort of stuff. But the reason why I bring it to him is because like, is the interaction with him. It's his following up with me. Yep. It's Bruce the, it, it, what's, it, what's that? Bruce at, at Corey's, that, that's where we take. Bruce is awesome. awesome. Yeah, take. Bruce is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so he, it's just, it's that interaction that I have with him. And I don't, you know, I, I assume he does a great job. And it's even the things like, yeah, he'll fix something and just say, oh, it's this and no charge. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, you know, it, it's that interaction that he's, that he understands. And it's, is the reason why I'm going to go back to him. Right. Um, because I want to work with him because while well, it's like, where else would I want to take my car? This guy's going to, he's going to take care of me. Um, and, and so you do need to have that quality. And now if he, he messed up my car and I brought it some other place and found that, that he wasn't doing a good job, that's a problem. But in the end there, I'm really looking at him because of the quality of service that, that I'm getting from him and his organization.
Yeah, I think some of that is is a natural ability within people, but I do think it's a maturity thing too, yeah. where you know, kind of foundationally, you want to have good disciplines that drive the quality of work, and then where you can grow beyond that is saying, you know, how can I look at this from a quality of service perspective? And that's what's going to move the needle. That's what's going to make the lasting impact at the end of the day. The quality of work is a little bit of table stakes. It's, it's um, behind the scenes in a sense. Quality of service is how you represent, you know, how you're getting that done. Looky, looky. I thought I didn't add this in. This one is in, which is number seven, which is why existing clients are good prospects. Um, he, this was a, um, I'm glad that I've got this one in here because, um, you know, he's really pointing out some key things, which is uh, just naturally, I think people like the um, new client, you know, winning new clients and going after new work. But um, he points out some um, obvious and not so obvious things, which is the odds of winning existing client uh, business are better than new, uh, are better than new clients. The marketing costs for similar volume of business are lower. Follow on projects are more profitable because you have the potential, like if you're doing a brand new project with someone, you're not going to put any juniors on that project. And as you develop the relationship and they're comfortable with you and they realize all your people are great, whether they're a senior or a junior, then you have the potential to add more juniors. Uh, it provides opportunity to new, do new types of work. I mean, you're right now we're experiencing this where, you know, a, a existing customers, I would argue understand the quality of service that they're going to get from us and are okay with us going after new types of work because of the way that we deliver on projects. And so it even gives us the opportunity to build out new types of work for us when we work for that existing client. And we wouldn't want to, you know, you and I don't want to do the first project, a brand new type of project for a brand new client. That's, that's asking for it. Right. And I think, you know, with this one, the challenge that you have is when there are new leads that come in, um, timing is everything. You know, you, it, it, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And when you get an opportunity that comes in the pipeline to, to work with a client, if it's a new one, um, I think you tend to put energy towards that, not just because it's new, but because there is an expressed interest to do something. Um, existing clients, um, I think we don't turn away or, or not put the equal or, or even more energy towards pursuing a, a lead that comes to us that's from an existing client. I think where we're challenged at times is how do you find more work that's out there, but it's not coming to you. You have to find it. And I think that's where, um, you know, you have to take an approach of how do I, you know, um, work my relationship? You know, how do I go to an account and, and use the equity of I've done great work here to get references? It's kind of asking that question of, you know, do you know others that would need similar work done that would appreciate, you know, the mm -hmm. quality of work that we do? And that, you know, that that's not as easy to do at times. It, it feels like you're, um, you know, you're, you're begging for some things and um, versus delivering is exciting. It's, it's easier to, to deliver versus ask for a favor. Um, so I, I think that's where sometimes the challenge is. And it's, you know, it's uh, something that you have to kind of uh, be a little bit more thoughtful and a little bit more experienced of how do I, you know, work with an existing client to find emerging opportunities that are not brought to my attention directly. Awesome. Number eight reminds me of uh, the Covey principle, um, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Because it's what is what is it what does it feel like to be a buyer? And I think it's this is really important um, when we're talking about the practice development or sales and marketing and understanding what does it feel like to be on the other side of the table. And the fact that they're you know you know with a professional services firm they're 
they are going outside of their internal teams to bring someone from the outside to go do something. And he points out the different feelings that someone might feel as a buyer. And I think a lot of these are like, yeah, and especially you can relate it to your own experiences and when you might have hired somebody to do some professional services work around the house or whatever, or back to the automobile example, which is what does mm-hmm. it feel like to be a buyer? Number one, I'm feeling insecure. I'm not sure how to detect which of the finalists is the genius and which is just good. I've exhausted my abilities to make technical distinction. Number two, I'm feeling threatened. This is my area of responsibility. Even though intellectually I know it's outside expertise, emotionally it's not comfortable to put my affairs in the hands of others. Number three, I'm taking a personal risk by putting my affairs in the hands of someone else. I risk losing control. Number four, I'm impatient. I didn't call someone at the first sign of symptoms or opportunity. I've been thinking about this for a while. Number five, I'm worried by the very fact of suggesting improvements or changes. These people are going to be implying that I haven't been doing it right up to now. Are these people going to be on my side? Number six, I'm exposed. Whoever I hire is not going. Um, whoever I hire, I'm going to, have to re- reveal some proprietary secrets, not of all or which are flattering. I will have to undress. Oh my goodness. Number seven, I'm feeling ignorant, and I don't like the feeling. I don't know if I've got a simple problem or a complex one. I'm not sure if I can trust them to be honest about that. It's in their interest to convince me that it's complex. Number eight, I'm skeptical. I've been burnt before by these types of people. You get a lot of promises. How do I know which promise I should buy? And number nine, I'm concerned that they either can't or won't take the time to understand what makes my situation special. They'll try to sell me what they've got rather than what I need. And finally, number 10, I'm suspicious. Will they, will they be those typical professionals who are hard to get hold of, who are patronizing, who leave you out of the loop, who befuddle you with jargon, who don't explain what they're doing or why or who, who, in short, these people will deal with me. Will they deal with me in a way that I want to be dealt with? Thoughts, Tommy? Yeah, these are great things to think about um, as you're working with a prospective customer. Um, I, I look at, these are a lot of things that I think about, um, when I'm working with someone and, and trying to find ways of being able to, um, mitigate those risks that they have and and concerns that they have. So like I was saying before, I'd like to take the sales process and turn that into a delivery process where, you know, making and keeping commitments and, and, um, you know, making, being responsive, um, thinking about, um, you know, what would I be concerned about? And what would I like to see to put some of my concerns at risk? And then also just acting as a bigger team. I, I always like to put it in the perspective of we, you know, together, you know, not you and then us, but we, there's a greater team here. And we know to be successful, we have to work as a team and, um, you know, have levels of transparency and, and, and it can get tricky in, in a, in a process, sales process, especially when it's a competitive one mm-hmm. where there's other consulting firms that are involved where they can have an advantage if you're too transparent where, you know, they just can't shake out what is true and what is false until they really get into the thick of the project. So in that sales stage, there's, there's a bit of, you can only be so, you know, so transparent without being negligible, you know, negligent, I say, um, with the client. So I, I try to have a, a good balance so they know that we're human, you know, we're making mistakes. There's things that, um, you know, we're, we're not going to be the best at, but in, in whole, we can solve this problem, you know, for you. And this is why, and I, I think you, you do want to have a level of, um, humility, but a level of confidence and we call it humble confidence. And, and that, you know, we try to display that again in the sales process. So they know what they're going to experience when we deliver for them. 
Number nine is one that it's it's hunters versus farmers. And I thought that he was actually, this was going to be covering something different. But for this, because in sales, you have this concept of hunters versus farmers. And this, he's sort of like characterizing the your organization and what type of organization that you are. And he describes two different types, one where it's a hunter type of organization and one where it's a farmer. And of course, there's there's pros and cons to each of them. It's not like he's saying, you, you know, you have to be one over the other, but each has its sort of benefits out of it. And if I look at the hunter organization, this one, um, the central principle around the hunter is like individual entrepreneurialism. Um, it's it's a focus, it's management style, it's bottom line numbers. It's, it's a, uh, the self-image is street fighters. The leader for the hunter organization is whoever the best hunter is. The decision making is decentralized, so it's autonomous. It's really the key strengths for that type of organization is around diversity, for flexibility. It's an organization that basically wants to go out and find work um, and go find that next big engagement, you know, almost regardless regardless of what it is. And then you have the funter, uh, the uh, the funter organization, the farmer organization, <laughs> which is really the key principle. There is firm wide collaboration. Its, its key strengths are around um, focused strategy, its internal atmosphere, whereas uh, for hunters, it's very competitive. For farmers, it's more collaborative. The management style is not around the bottom line numbers. It's more around values and mission. Uh, people's self-image inside the organization is more about being a team player than a street fighter. The leader is the high priest versus the best hunter. Uh, and the decision making is coordinated. It's interdependent as opposed to being decentralized. And of course, when I read through these, I'm going like three walls, definitely a, more of a farmer type of organization. Right. That's sort of who we are. But I think as we grow, we're also sort of like wanting to encourage the hunter type of mentality about like we always, you know, we are we, with like coordinating efforts and going out to the market with a set of service offerings and, and anticipating the problems before we even know them. You, we do a lot of things that are very coordinated, you know, where we are well thought out and we're trying to think through things. But then there's also the benefits of just going out and talk, you know, and hunting down, finding places where people need help and they need somebody to come in and, and really, you know, to, to be able to be flexible. And it might, they might not have a specific service offering around that, but they're coming in and they're helping you solve that problem. So thoughts on this yeah i think you know, we we definitely need more hunters within the organization i hate to say that as a person that doesn't <laughs> often, but. okay it's okay it's all right There's some real growth um, here. but uh yeah but I, I i definitely think there's an element and we've had some discussions um around this around uh entrepreneurism yep. And I think from a growth perspective, having a few more entrepreneurial thinking people um, is going to be good for diversity in the environment and to grow, you know, different practices um, and to, you know, just kind of spread the, the responsibility of thinking about um, how to be successful from a business perspective. And I think, you know, the, a lot of the farmer mentality you know, works well for something that's established and you need a team to kind of just get it done after it's, um, you know, after it's figured out, um, that works well. Um, but you have to have something to farm. And so you need those hunters out there in the organization that help push to the next level. And we've talked about this growth is, is healthy and, and, um, it's, it's something that, you know, gives us the ability to use more of our gifts and, and to be able to have some diversity of things that we can do as an organization. So it's not going to be done by a bunch of farmers. We're going to need more hunters to do that. Number 10 is the, from the last chapter, and it's asset management. He's basically pointing out if there's any one major theme in this book is to – it is the key to ensuring that any professional's for, sir, professional firm's future is wise management of two key assets. It's inventory of skills, talent knowledge and ability and then it's strength of its client relations and reputation yeah and i you know i, I think we've got a, a great reputation um and that's bias of course you know why would i not say that <laughs> <laughs> once you would need um, to resign today right right i think we get um good comments around that sure, i think sure. some of it has to do with our 
how much we care about quality of work. Um, and, and, you know, the way we've approached growth, we've been really conservative in that. So when you are conservative uh, with your growth, you've got the opportunity to keep a strong reputation. Um, so then you know, that's something that we always worry about as we grow is, you know, keeping that reputation of doing great work for our customers. And there I go, I say great work versus great service. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, the, the skills and talent, I think we've got great people in our challenges, how, how to bring in more j- junior people and, and spread that love of, of, of knowledge and, and, you know, uh, foster an environment of learning. And we're doing a lot of great things towards that. And, um, we have some, you know, great kind of practices, um, that are done internally to, to continue to share things with others. Um, it probably is going to need to get more intense as we get people to have a larger skill gap that need to be ramped up and nurtured appropriately to be successful. Awesome. I have one, I have an 11, which I have to throw. Oh, I have 11 that I have to throw I don't see in it here. In the slide. It's not in the slides. I'll add it to the slides afterwards before I upload them, which is actually the first, it's the first couple of paragraphs of the book, um, which is sort of what got me you know, going on this. And I think what, for like me, I usually read the first couple of uh, paragraphs of a book before I buy it. And, and so what this, I just found this really um, interesting and, and, and important. He says one of the, and I'll just, I'm just starting out at the beginning. One of the most in, in, interesting discoveries in my consulting work has been the fact that apparently every professional service firm in the world has the same mission statement, regardless of the firm's size, specific profession, or country of operation. With varying refinements of language, the mission of most professional ser- professional firms is to deliver outstanding client service, to provide fulfilling careers and professional satisfaction for our people, and to achieve financial success that w- so that we can reward ourselves and grow. The commonality of this mission does not detract from its value. Simply put, every professional firm must satisfy these three goals of service, satisfaction and success if it is to survive management of a professional service firm requires a delicate balancing act between the demands of the client marketplace the reality is the people marketplace the market for staff and the firm's economic ambitions cool yes it's- yes and um I, I, those are you know, it's a good way to, to look at it and a good way to kind of assess what is important, what kind of rises to the top um, to be able to be successful as a professional services firm. And I, you know, I just want to thank you, Danny, for, sure. you know, bringing this book in as a book club. I think, you know, it's one of those things that at first I thought it was going to be, you know, some really kind of basic common sense stuff. But I, I think this book has some really good challenging um, concepts. You can tell it's well thought out and well researched in terms of, you know, what are the things that are important to look at and how to how to look at it. Um, and I think it's going to, you know, feed us for the next few years of ideas on how we can grow as an organization. So I appreciate Absolutely. bringing this in taking the time to lead us through. Absolutely. This book. What would you say would be the is and I think I've picked up on it, which sounds sort of like the quality of work versus the quality of service. Do you think that's the big what's your big takeaway from the from the whole book? If there if you could sort of summarize it in one or two um, takeaways, what would you say it would be, Tom? Yeah, I, I would say that the two top things, I know we'd like to say three, but our, our, I'll bring it down to two. To me, the two top things are quality of mm-hmm. service. Um, and and thinking of ways that we can drive more satisfaction through quality of service. Um, and that includes, you know, being more consultative and, and having some of the more softer skills and, and working with our clients. And the other one is the, the ability to, um, grow junior, Mm -hmm. Um, associates at the company. And I think we've always been interested in that. And I think it's going to take quite a bit of work to do that um, work and investment. Uh, but I think what it does is it, it feeds um, an economic engine and, uh, and 
and you know we have our clients listening to this and probably other professional services firms you know the the you want to have a healthy economic engine that allows you to just do more things have have more um, impact and and if we're thinking of ways to be more efficient and effective and and not being quote top heavy with a bunch of very senior folks it makes us more competitive yeah. in the marketplace able to provide you know great service at, at at good you know good costs to our clients and if we're not putting the energy and, and work towards being able to bring in more junior folks then you know we're in a sense could be overcharging people you know i hate to say that and I, I, you know that's kind of a vulnerable thing to say but at the end of the day we should be you know trying to challenge ourselves to have a good mix of people and you know that speaks to the under delegation problem it, it, it speaks to you know are we putting the right measurements in place to um, reward things that will drive us to um, kind of grow with more junior folks and also deliver with quality of service so i you know i think that quality of service and and being able to do more procedural um, type work um, is going to be healthy for us and and I think it's it's something that is exciting to do and I think our organization although they want to do the quote new things I think when you start doing things and you do them very well we just have to point you know the the team in the right direction of things that we can do very well and repetitively and and we've experienced some of that and we just need to find more ways to grow through you know, finding work that we can repeat and, and, and over exceed the expectations of our clients. Awesome. Thanks, Tommy, for taking the time to do this. And, and uh, thank you, everybody, for listening and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Work Together Better podcast. We're available on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn. If you're looking for a partner to help you craft a modern digital workplace on the Microsoft Cloud, please come by and see us at 3will.com. That's the number three spelled out, W-I-L-L.com. Thank you and have a great day.